Welcome to OU Informed, a podcast where Open University academics illuminate the issues and topics of our times. In this episode, we ask whether prisons do the jobs they were originally created to do. Has there been an increasingly enlightened approach to balancing reform, care and punishment? What did this look like in past regimes? And where is our current system succeeding and failing? To answer these questions, I spoke to The Open University's Dr David Scott, who has published more than 15 books on issues around crime, punishment and justice, including his most recent work, Against Imprisonment. He's a former coordinator of the European Group for the Study of Deviance and Social Control, the most established critical criminology forum in the world today. He's also a member of the Academic Advisory Board for Inquest, a charity supporting the bereaved families of those who die in state custody. Now, there have been prisons in existence going back to Egyptian times. So we have always had the option of some form of detention in civilised societies. But it wasn't until the 1770s and really going through to the beginning of the 19th century that what we actually saw was the development of a prison as a place which would be of rehabilitation. That is, it was at this moment, at this point in history, when it was suggested by utilitarian philosophers like Jeremy Bentham and uh, those in the Christian tradition like John Howard, that we could have a prison that could transform an individual, that could change them, that could take this criminal personality and through their... Um, punishment and through their reformation in the prison place could turn them into a law-abiding person. That notion that prison could somehow instill people with a sense of moral fibre and moral backbone. And when we look at this in the context of England and Wales, there was initiatives, as I mentioned, from the late 1770s onwards to actually try and bring in this new reform prison. And one of the leading people who wanted to do that was Jeremy Bentham, who wanted to have this surveillance machine, what he called the panopticon, which would be a design where you would have somebody sitting almost in the centre of a spider's web and could then look out via different ways and could watch and observe and discipline and control the individuals who were under their kind of sight. Now, he wanted to do this as a private prison, and he spent many, many years trying to establish this panoptican-like prison. It actually didn't work out that way. He was, in the end, unsuccessful. And a state prison was built in 1816, which was called the General Penitentiary. And it was just down by the Thames, where the current uh, Tate Museum is right now. And the General Penitentiary in a place called Millbank became known as Millbank Penitentiary or Millbank Prison. Now, the term penitentiary, as these early reformed prisons were referred to, is really, really significant and gives us an insight into that Christian um, aspect to the development of the prison, because it was all about making people penitent. You were to send people into the prison place and you were to make them repent, to look at their own individualised problems, to look at their own individual immorality and to place them into an institution which would transform that and instill them with that kind of moral sense of, I want to be a law-abiding and good citizen. Now, the early penitentiary initiatives, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States, because both evolved at a very, very similar time in these countries, were quite frankly an absolute and total humanitarian disaster. They didn't work. You had in, for example, Millbank um, uh, a penitentiary that almost immediately when the first people who were incarcerated in it, which were actually women in 1815, uh, 18, 16, there was an immediate disturbance. They, they kicked back against the regime. You then had, a couple of years later, the introduction of a chaplain governor, a guy called Daniel Nyhill. And what Daniel Nyhill did, he got his, what were then recalled uh, warders or turnkeys, what today we'd call prison officers, he got them to simply um, read scripture 
to the um, to the prisoners who were in solitary confinement in effect. They were then taken um, for one uh, part of the day, every single day to the, to, the, to the chapel, where they were placed in boxes where they couldn't communicate with anybody else. And they were sermoned uh, for, for about uh, an hour, telling them how horrible they were and how immoral they were and how problematic they were in terms of fitting in with wider society. No mention of poverty. No mention of social inequalities, no mention of the harms that were generated by others on the outside, but rather to look at a group of relatively impoverished people who were placed in an institution which was there to change them, there to make them into better people. The ultimate uh, conclusion on the general penitentiary in Millbank was that this was an institution which led to massive ill health. It led to um, a number of, of people taking their own lives. And it also led to both, as I mentioned, in terms of the health, both physical and mental health problems. It was seen as an absolute and total failure. So that original Christian motivation of getting people to be penitent if we explore that further, what kind of historical context did that drive come out of? Well, it was, to some extent, there was this kind of, um, the Christian kind of element was this, this sense of that um, people who were breaking the law were uh, kind of doing so because they lacked kind of moral sense of, of, of fibre. But institutionally wise, of course, there was a sense that you could have a monastery. And if you had a monastery... You would have these people who would, because of their commitment to actual, um, to, to religious kind of beliefs, would then go in these places and they would actually become very disciplined or self-disciplined individuals. Now, there's a little bit of, of mythology around um, the monastery and certainly when it comes to nunneries. Um, uh, perhaps one of the most famous kind of uh, <coughs> phrases from Hamlet is um, when Hamlet uh, goes to Ophelia and says, get thee to a nunnery, because it was all about Ophelia being a, a kind of a woman who'd actually deviated. And that's what nunneries were filled with. They were filled with, with deviant women who were then, they weren't necessarily very pious or religious. They were being placed into these institutions because actually it was seen as a way of actually trying to either deal with, with their kind of problematic behaviour or it was because they were seen as fallen women and so on and so forth. And the monasteries, again, as a, as a kind of institution, they were, they were places which were seen as bringing out the very best of people in terms of their self-discipline. So there was that idea. But at the same time, you also had this scientific dimension which came from utilitarian, which was all about uh, the utilitarianism of, of, of Jeremy Bentham, which was all about pain and pleasure. And if you could actually just get that balance between making something um, so unpleasant that it outweighed the pleasure of crime then you would actually have a way of, of, of the human psyche kind of conforming to a kind of more law-abiding behaviour in the future. So you have this kind of, these two very different traditions, but they came together at the time of the 1770s through to the early 19th century as this kind of joint justification for these new institutions of pain and suffering. And of course, as it went forward through the actual 19th century, what you saw was that these institutions, despite the general failure of, 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 of Millbank Penitentiary, you had then massive investment, for example, in the 1840s in Pentonville Prison in London, um, which was there all about, again, reformation. It was all about, again, inspired by um, the prison chaplain who was there to instill virtue. And the power of the chaplain within these early institutions was enormous. And it was all about trying to actually say, look, if we can just give you these, this moral kind of backbone, then you will be a good person in society. Now, the problem was, it wasn't just that Milbank had failed, Pentonville by the 1860s and 1870s was also seen as a failure. And what we saw then was almost an abandonment of this original mission that had been set up from the 1770s onwards. And we had this um, uh, introduction of uh, a regime which you may kind of be familiar with a little bit in terms of the phraseology, but hard fare, hard bed, hard labour. 
Prisons under, under, the, um, under the stewardship of Edmund de Caen, who was at that point the, the leading kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, figure in, in prisons. And prisons throughout the 19th century had actually become much more centralised. And certainly the convict prisons, which is what we're referring to here, um, they became much more under the control of a very centralised system and a very disciplined system. And for de Caen, it was all about deterrence. It was all about punishment. It was about grinding rogues good. So you then saw this shift from more of, let's educate them. Let's kind of give people a new sense of, of moral uh, fibre and backbone through religion to one of, let's just make them work really, really hard. Let's put them on the, on the, on the, tread, on the treadmill. Let's give them the crank to turn. Let's give them various different forms of, of totally useless labour which would actually be a way of, of getting those people disciplined. So the discipline element was there, but it wasn't through religion now, it was through work and labour. How much influence on that approach came from a military approach to discipline and order? Well, there was a, a very strong connection between this notion of military discipline and the early prisons in terms of how the uh, regimes were organised. And in fact, people like Duquesne came from military backgrounds. So you had this, uh, this kind of sense of uh, a, a prisons as they evolved, certainly by the latter part of the 19th century, were almost para... Uh, I was going to say, uh, they were almost kind of military... Um, almost military uh, designed in terms of how the prison officers would work. So you then had all oh, prison warders, as they referred to at that given time. They were then done in a very uh, structured way in terms of their discipline control, the uniform, the hats, the kind of the, the, the kind of construction of, of kind of orders. Um, the, the, this evolution of the of the prison, it was almost like let's give them this sense of of, of hard labour and discipline. And yes, it did have certain similarities with the military. But of course, when you looked at the people who were being sent to prison. And this is actually another historical continuity which we've never got away with, uh, we've, sorry, that we've never got away from even today, is actually that these are people who often have quite significant problems. They're not necessarily going to be somebody who's going to be recruited into a regiment. Um, you know, they're not going to be going into the armed forces because they're simply... Of, of kind of various different uh, uh, physical ailments and sometimes mental health problems, which would mean that they wouldn't necessarily be very suitable for a military regime. So you have that sense of the barracks, you have that sense of um, the monastery. Another element which, of course, was important in this time was the factory. And one of the arguments that's been made about the history of the prison is that this whole sense of discipline, whether it be in terms of military discipline, religious discipline, or of course, work-based discipline, you wanted people to know that you had to turn up and be timetabled and you had to turn up for work at a given time. So um, people like um, the philosopher Michel Foucault, um, he has argued that when you look at this evolution of the prison, what you actually have is this focus on discipline so that actually it fits in with a much more disciplinary society. It fits in with the regime where you actually have this sense of people must be disciplined so they turn up for work. People will be disciplined in other ways, as we mentioned in terms of um, the monastery and, and the barracks. But these aspects were all very, very significant. And the prison... The prison had to be, for him, and indeed for, for others, uh, historians, uh, certainly in the 1970s, when, when this became a very, very hot topic for history, it was all about this interconnection between, um, you know, these different forms of institutions and how we needed to have people who were able to kind of move from one to the other. And, of course, at the same time, you also had the birth of the asylum. So you had this other institution, which was all about, let's just take the people that we have a worry about and let's put them into an institution and let's see if the institution can somehow change them. And that mentality, we've never lost that. That hasn't gone away from the 1800s. But of course, what has happened 
is that we are now, with 200 years of history, very clear that that institutional answer doesn't work. So we've talked about a couple of hundred years worth historical mission and purpose around prisons and how that evolved. Was there an increasingly enlightened approach to imprisonment? Yes, I think that um, we, we obviously need to situate this within its historical context. Um, and I think the enlightened voices and the voices of reason and the voices of knowledge and the voices of the practitioners and the voices of prisoners and prison officers, the voices of people who actually know what's going on in prisons, they need to be heard. And I think that there has been uh, a general sense of enlightenment um, throughout this 200 plus years of the prison experiment. But when we actually look at some of the most plausible and convincing voices, which are generally people within the system, we actually find that they're quite critical, if not totally damning, of the actual prison regime. And I think it's just if we just for one moment consider a couple of the most significant people in terms of the evolution of of, of the kind of prisons, even those like um, like uh, Edmund de Cain, who was very very strongly promoting the discipline, even he kind of had was it when you read his his writings on on the kind of prison, even he was kind of had elements where you thought perhaps he's not entirely convinced by the kind of the the, the, the kind of the, the whole approach that's being developed here. But certainly when we get to the uh, towards the end of the uh, Edmund de Caen uh, regime, by the time you get to the 1890s, and all the controversies that were coming up about his very disciplinarian approach, we start to get voices um, from within the actual the government and within the prison service saying there's something not quite right here. Perhaps one of the, the strongest voices came from... Sir Godfrey Lushington. And Lushington was the permanent Under Secretary of State for the Home Office in the UK from the 1880s through to 1895. An incredibly important civil servant in terms of how the prison system was running at that given time. And I just want to read you just one very short extract um, from 1895, where he talks about um, what he thinks prisons are able to do in terms of the reformation of character. And this is his summing up of actually what he thought the prison could do in terms of this historical mission from the 1770s onwards to reform. And he states, The crushing of self-respect, the starving of all moral instinct he or she may possess, the absence of all opportunity to do and receive a kindness, the continual association with none but criminals, the forced labour and the denial of liberty. I believe the true mode of reforming a man or woman or restoring him or her to society is exactly in the opposite direction of all of these. But of course, this is a mere idea. It is quite impractical in a prison. In fact, the unfavourable features I have mentioned are inseparable from prison life. So here we have, in the 1890s, one of the most significant figures in the running of convict and other prisons in the UK telling us that the problems of imprisonment cannot be actually altered and that this is not going to lead us to the reformation of actually the people that we hold inside. But Lushington wasn't the only voice. Lushington wasn't the only person from within the system who actually had that enlightened sense that there was something very wrong with how prisons were developing and moving forward. Another very, very famous character um, and probably the most influential uh, reformer of prisons at the beginning of the 20th century was Sir Alexander Patterson. 
Now, Sir Alexander Patterson was very famous because he set up the Borstal regime, um, which was a, 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 an institution for children in the village of Borstal in the, in the early 1900s, and it then turned into the Young Offenders institutions that we have today. But it was very famous because in the early days it was based on the principles of Eton and it was a place for kind of for schooling children and it was said, well, give them a, a decent education. And he was a very compassionate and uh, very uh, strong advocate of actually prisons being a punishment in its own right and that they should have not the same sense of hard bed, hard fare, hard labour that, that people like Duquesne had had. It wasn't about deterrence, it was about reformation. And yet even Sir Alexander Patterson came out with phrases like, prisons were spaces of a living death. The prisons were, and this is again is his words, were an unhealthy little cesspool. This is the person who's trying to make it change. The most famous prison commissioner of the time is able to say there's something wrong here. But of course, most famously of all, by the time he got towards the end of his career, he was saying, look, we have to actually abandon the idea of calling these institutions prisons or penitentiaries. This man who spent his whole time in a very, very significant um, place in terms of prison reform is saying we can't call these institutions anymore. He felt that they were places which could be there for psychiatric diagnosis to help with people who've got mental health problems coming in. He felt that they could be places potentially of training and education. But most of all, he felt they had to be places of non-punitive detention. So when you've got people right at the top of the tree with that enlightened reaction to places they've spent their entire careers working in, what were the forces reacting against that enlightened thinking and perpetuating um, prisons as we know them? Well, at the time of both um, when Lushington and, and Patterson were actually um, at their peak of powers, we actually had this, this quite radical reduction in prison populations. So we never saw the kind of the, the end of the prison, but what we saw at the beginning of the 1900s, right the way through until um, the 1930s, we had this de-escalation of prisons. We had this recognition at this time that there was something very wrong with prisons. Now, it wasn't just the voices of people like Lushington and Patterson with, from within um, the actual system, but also you've got to remember this is a time when you had the suffragettes and a lot of very wealthy women were spending time in prisons. One example would be Lady Constance Lytton. Now, she um, spent time um, in prisons um, in the late 1900s, early 1910s as a suffragette. And she, she went in both under her own name as Lady Constance Lytton and as sister-in-law of a former Liberal uh, Prime Minister from the early 1900s. But she also went in prison as Jane Wharton. Who was uh, she? She kind of pretended she was somebody else, and of course she was caught up in the cat and mouse, and was force-fed, and it nearly killed her. And in fact, she wrote her autobiography in 1914 following a stroke that she'd had. Um, but her voice was was starting to get out there. There was conscientious objectors to the First World War. Um, there were people who, from very middle-class backgrounds, were finding themselves behind bars. You even had people like Winston Churchill coming out and saying that the way that a prison was run was a mark of the civilization of a society. And if we were exceptionally punitive or excessive in our punishments of people, then of course that looked bad on us as a whole society. You then of course had the incarceration of people because of their sexuality, which went all the way through to the 1950s. Um, even at this, this time, when you could argue there was this generation of a bad conscience about prisons, that, that people recognised that prisons didn't work, that people came along and said, like Patterson, like Lushington, um, that actually we had this um, situation where people were learning from the past, they were looking back, they were looking at the 19th century humanitarian disaster that was the prison. As we went past the Second World War, however, we started to see a gradual rise in 
in the prison population. It was it was slow, and there was still a lot of a very considered and uh, and critical voices. And we had it alongside people from the civil service and from the prison service itself. You had prisoner voices coming to the fore. You even by the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s had prison officers writing their autobiographies. The proliferation of knowledge about the harms of prison deepened and deepened as we went through um, the, the 20th century. But at the same time, you had this uh, gradual rise. And then by the 1970s, something suddenly happened in the sense that prison populations start to go up quite dramatically. Now, we talked a bit earlier about this connection between prisons and the factory and the asylum um, and the monastery and the workhouse. These different institutions which are to control people that nobody wants, to control people at the bottom end of society. What we were going through in the early part of um, the 19th century was the liberal reform and the evolution of a welfare state. And perhaps it should come as no surprise to us that when we had this greater emphasis on social welfare, when we had um, recognition of the five giants, as Beveridge put it, when we had the introduction of a national health service, when we had the introduction of free education, when we had a sense that as a society we were moving forward together, that you had a lot less reliance on prisons. And indeed, by the time we got to the 1950s, 1960s, there was genuine talk of abolishing prisons. We saw at that time the dismantling of the asylum system, albeit it was then a shift towards a more private form of, of confinement of mental health problems and not necessarily the end of, of, of asylums as, um, or at least the detention of people under mental health legislation. But we did see that kind of end of the big public asylums that had been existing from, the again, the similar time of the prison birth in the 17, late, late 1700s, early 1800s. And you then had this moment where people were saying, Maybe we should actually bring the prison to an end. So to some extent, what Patterson and Lushington were starting to bring out, and many, many others, was a common sense that we needed to actually, we need to kind of to reduce or end our use of imprisonment because it didn't work. The 1970s, the crisis of capitalism, the gradual um, revocation of the welfare state, the ratcheting up of a law and order society, the ratcheting up of punishment as an answer, the ratcheting up of the argument that you don't try and include people on the margins or the bottom end of society anymore. You put them in an institution and you throw away the key. And what we've seen since the 1970s is, to some extent, um, uh, a, a growing prison population and also arguments that people have made that prisons might just work that prisons might be institutions that can do these things that, 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 that they claim to do. So we're talking here about the British penal system. How much of an influence was coming from outside in terms of how other countries were doing things? Well, I mean, the, I mean it's, it's, if we just focus on America for one second, I mean, it, we can take this right back to the, 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 the late 18th century and the 1770s again, because both the, the penitentiary, as it evolved, um, it was actually, um, basically, so in America you had, um, at the same time that there was Bentham and John Howard in, in, the, in the UK, who were actually uh, advocating prisons, you had at the same time in America people like Rush advocating prisons as places of reform. Now, they came up with a system which was called the separate and the silent system. And this was something which impacted both the UK and American prisons right the way through to the 1930s. And the argument was, was that you either had prisoners who were completely separated out, so there couldn't be these criminal associations between them, or you had them in absolute silence. And to some extent, the debates in prisons throughout the um, the 1800s was which of these actually works best? 
and um, both America and and the UK. As it turned out, neither of them worked at all. Um, and by the 1930s, um, they actually brought in the sense of well, we actually can allow people to speak to each other, um, and we can actually allow people to associate and connect because they realised that that this could be really really damaging for people to be taken and bereft of not only their family, but also of other associations with human beings. And as we are intersubjective people, as we are people who um, rely upon and require and need engagement with other human beings, by placing people in, in solitary, um, we recognise that's um, actually, or we have to some extent recognised that is a massive problem. But just to go back to the present day, it's that very issue in America of solitary confinement and long-term solitary confinement, which is where the concerns are. And of course, it's the lower, larger prisons, it's the, the supermax prisons, it's the high security. It's what's been sometimes referred to as the, the kind of living tombs, the iron coffins, where you can actually have institutions which are so controlling and so much um, in terms of security that you can prevent rebellion, you can prevent people from escaping, but you actually condemn people to a living death because they have no connection with others. And this is something which, in particular America in recent times, where America's in a mass escalation, it also from the 1970s onwards, saw this mass rise in prison populations. And of course, both America, uh, Britain, uh, America under Reagan, Britain under Thatcher, they both went from social democratic kind of societies to neoliberal capitalism. And of course, that meant having a lot less care for the welfare system. So both of them went through that, but the American penal system has had this very strong, large... Um, Supersized prisons, um, where they've had very high security and have been have been iron coffins. There is no doubt in that. In the UK, we've had a much smaller um, base set of prisons. There has been some larger prisons of over a thousand people, but in the main prisons have been much smaller. However, in recent times, penal policy is to create mega prisons, and the current agenda is to create six new mega prisons, and of course they are cheaper. They are cheaper to run. You could have no frills prisons with less staff, um, a larger physical plant, but less people to pay out in terms of wages. So therefore, you can you can manage larger numbers of people um, for lower uh, costs, and that's been where we've kind of been going um, in terms of recent uh, kind of penal policy. It seems to be widely known that a large percentage of prison populations share common characteristics. Uh, one of those being that they've been in prison before. Having that knowledge and that data there, what forces are acting against addressing that, if any? Well, I suppose you're quite right. The recidivism rates, as we refer to them, um, are that we have, for certainly for young people, extraordinarily high numbers of recidivism or re-offending, you know, 70-odd percent. For, for adults across the board, it's above 50%. So, I mean, these figures do change over years, but they're, they're the ballpark figures for quite some time. Um, and, you know, you have that sense of, well, we recognise that actually prisons are a revolving machine. People go into them and it's a revolving door. They then kind of go back, they go out, they come back in. What's kind of pushing pushing the agenda on, I think, is, is that kind of attachment to punishment. It's, that, it's the construction of, of people as, as dangerous. It's the construction that we have no other alternative to deal with certain forms of, of, of wrongful behaviour. And certainly there's been a, a political agenda. Prisons from at least the 1970s through to probably um, uh, the last few years have been a political football where uh, it's almost been seen as known goal to talk down prisons. So politicians, um, from example, um, Tony Blair, following um, the tragic death of James Bulger um, by Thompson and Venables, he came out with the slogan... Um, uh, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. And the Labour Party, whether in power or indeed um, in opposition, has not marked out an alternative 
um, to uh, to dealing with kind of to, with people who've done wrong, which has been in any way different from what the Conservatives have said, which has been quite a hard law and order, punitive rhetoric. So part of it is a political will. Part of it is a sense also that despite all the evidence, historically and in the present, that somehow prisons can still rehabilitate, that somehow prisons can still do something that's good. So you have very, very um, well-known kind of uh, uh, critics of prisons as places of rehabilitation, like, for example, Lord Wolfe, who was a very prominent penal reformer in the early 1990s, like Douglas Hurd, who was the Home Secretary in the early 1990s. And people like that have come out and said, prisons are an expensive way of making bad people worse. Whether we would necessarily want to keep that phrase, bad people, in there, I think there would be a definite kind of argument that prisons are very expensive and they make people worse. And yet, and yet, for the last 20 more years, the official agenda of the government in England and Wales has been that prisons can work in places of, of reformation. But if they can't do it for that, they will work for incapacitation and they will work for deterrence. So these arguments of punishment, these arguments of, well, the people that we send to prison are largely dangerous and need to be punished, and this is going to deliver us justice, it's going to deliver something for the victim. We could unpack all of those different things, and what we'd find is that prisons deliver on none of those elements they don't really deal with victims um, they're focused on the offender and punishing them not meeting the victim's needs they don't really protect society because prisons are much more likely to engender violence through the actual uh, surviving the brutality of a prison regime these are not places of peace prisons are not places of care and compassion they're not places of reconciliation they're not places where people can lower the mask and start to address their actual uh, their wrongdoing or problematic conduct they're the exact opposite to survive in a prison place you almost have to conform to certain criminogenic uh, characteristics so it doesn't do that. It doesn't actually give us what we wanted to do. It's almost impossible to rehabilitate because people are individuals and they're dealt with as batches. They're dealt with as large groups of people and you never really get to address an individual's needs. So all the different kind of arguments that are put forward in terms of defending the prison, in the main, they, they kind of often collapse into a sense of, well, what are we going to do with them? We don't know. So let's put them into a prison because surely we've had prisons for hundreds of years. Surely we've got a history of success. Surely we haven't had penal reformers for, for, for kind of for centuries coming out and telling us there's something very wrong with the prison because it still keeps on going. And we're now in 2019, we still have a prison just like we've had going back over 200 years to the General Penitentiary at Millbank in 1816. So we've charted the way right up to the current system. What is the current British system looking like when we hold it up to scrutiny? So the, the current prison system is, uh, is in crisis. Uh, it's potentially facing even existential crisis because the knowledge of what's going wrong with prisons is getting out there. There's nearly uh, every other week there is somebody talking about the crisis in the prison place, whether that be about assaults, whether that be about um, self-inflicted deaths, whether that be about um, uh, prison officers and terms of prison officer numbers, whether that be about substance use, whether that be about um, the degrading and, 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 and horrible kind of uh, environment that prisons have become. Standards are quite frankly unacceptable just in terms of, of, of habitation. And um, there has been situations where you have um, the Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons, who are the, the main body of oversight. Um, they haven't really got that many um, strong powers, but they do write a number of damning reports on, on prisons. And they have given recommendation after recommendation, saying that prisons are not safe saying that prisons are actually damaging, that there's not enough rehabilitation going on, that there's not enough association and there's not enough activity, that prisons are profoundly unhealthy right now. And we only need to think about this in terms of self-inflicted deaths. And 
What I mean by self-inflicted death, some people would call suicide, but a suicide is actually a legal definition from the coroner. A self-inflicted death is when somebody's taken um, their life by their own hands. And we have um, a situation where only a couple of years ago in 2016, 120 people took their own lives in prisons in England and Wales. We have also record numbers of self-harm. You have people self-harming um, and being recorded of self-harming in prison, or an incident of self-harm, about every 10 minutes. You have people who are attempting to take their own lives, and every few hours, um, again, the data's kind of a bit sketchy on this, but every throughout few hours, there seems to be incidents where people uh, are, are kind of facing... Um, death, whether that be through drug overdoses or through attempted uh, ways to take their own lives through, through hanging and, and suffocation and so on and so forth. So prisons are actually, they are profoundly painful and they are so painful that some people find the only way out is to attempt to take their own lives because they have no hope, they have no sense of future, they've got potentially a context of mental health problems, they've struggled in, in kind of life up to this point, everything's kind of gone wrong to a certain point and they've now found themselves in an institution which is there um, and is based on deprivations. It's about taking things away, it's about loss. Prisons are institutions which undoubtedly um, are grounded in, in a logic of punishment. You then have this sense of, which is getting out there to the press, about the, the rate of violence and, 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 and physical and personal violence between um, uh, prisoners but also prisoners on staff. There's a little bit less but also quite a lot of, of knowledge and history on the violence of prison officers to, to prisoners. Um, or where, 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 where prison officers have suggested to other prisoners to go and do the dirty work for them. There's kind of anecdotal and prisoner autobiographical and prison officer autobiographical evidence to indicate that that continues up until this current day. So we have all these different elements in terms of dehumanisation, uh, the humiliation, um, the indignity of a prison place, the, the kind of the fact is that it's... You can never meet people's needs because prisons generate needs. They generate kind of that sense of uh, of, of, of of people wanting to engage and have having, having caring and supportive relationships with others. They can't deliver that. What prisons do, they kind of put people into isolation and therefore they're separated from the human beings or they're forced into the into the wings and this and the, and the, and the kind of um, and the landings, they're forced into relationships with people they don't necessarily want to have relationships with. It's like spending time with people that you don't want to spend time with. It can be very, very unpleasant. Um, so you have those kind of... And that's what all prison can do is one of the two. It just doesn't seem to kind of um, actually address that. Then you have the problems like we have at, say, Birmingham Prison. Now, Birmingham Prison was a private prison, one of 14 private prisons as of until recently. And it was taken back into state control because it ultimately was uh, an institution which was out of control. There were disturbances and um, people were, were kind of involved in, in large scale revolt and rebellion in prisons. And Birmingham was particularly um, uh, uh, prevalent because it's in a, in a city centre area. So lots of prison disturbances are hidden. Um, they don't get out. The press have their embargo to the press. So you don't know when there's been a prison disturbance all the time. But of course, if it's in a public um, public area, you've got the police cars and the ambulance and the fire brigade. You've got the, the kind of the mufti, uh, the, the, you know, the, they've got the kind of tactical squad um, that's been kind of put forward in terms of controlling and repressing the riot. People can see it. People can use their mobile phones and people can record it and there's evidence of something going on. Of course, Birmingham has been one of those prisons which has been in crisis. So you have have these kind of different elements coming together which are kind of pointing towards the problem of prison and then at the same time even though people like Sir Alexander Patterson and, and others talked about the prisons as being institutions where you could train he was somebody who quite rightly said you can't treat somebody um, to act or you can't teach somebody to to be free in captivity how can you learn to live in freedom when you're in an institution which is restricting your freedom. It just isn't, it is as impossible. And that's something that, that Patterson, the great reformer, was able to kind of like to argue. But that sense of what can we do in the prison? Well, 
we can't even necessarily turn them into these institutions of training, even if we so wanted to. We can't necessarily have these spaces, which is what the current government policy is, to have them have them as, as spaces for work and training and labour and so on and so forth. Because you have the problem of... There's two problems in prison with this, is that you have the problem of slave labour. You have the problem of exploitation. If you kind of put people into um, high-skilled or other forms of work and you don't pay them anything, the rate of exploitation, of course, is enormous. And it, it brings people's ideas back to that sense of slavery because people are, are kind of working for literally nothing. But then at the same time, you also have the problem of coerced idleness. So if an institution isn't able to kind of deliver people, or if a prison can't get people to work, then they're being coerced into doing nothing, which is then wasting time, and that can make prisons drag even, and the time in prison drag even longer and longer. And so these ideas in current policy... Um, of, of, of the government to, to say, well, well, we'll make prisoners work and we'll kind of, we'll, we'll get them, we'll make them work by having them as institutions of labour. And the new proposed prisons are all based on having forms of um, industrial plants within the actual kind of, in, um, within the actual fabric of the prison. It isn't going to work because it's going to undercut local labour. The people who are in prison often have mental health problems and can barely read or write, um, have kind of other difficulties in terms of um, kind of holding down work. The most prisoners have been unemployed. They're not highly skilled. The kind of work you can get them to do, they're probably going to struggle with. And there's also going to be the issue of sabotage, um, because if you've got, you to work for nothing, you're not necessarily going to want to say, I'm going to put my full heart and soul into this job, because quite frankly, I'm not going to get anything from it at the end of the day. None of this is going to help them in terms of actually moving forward in terms of solving that kind of financial element because that's the other kind of the final point is, of course, that prisons are having to cut their budgets and there's austerity of, 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 of penal regime. So they're cutting corners and that has meant that there's been kind of less staff. That hasn't necessarily got a direct causal relationship with rise in violence, but certainly it will have an impact in terms of what can be delivered in terms of education and other uh, services within the kind of prison itself. So you have this, we have this moment right now where the visibility of what's going wrong in prisons is exceptionally high, and it's going wrong on a number of different levels. And yet at the same time, you have David Gork coming out in February and saying, we need to abolish um, uh, sentences of under six months because prisons don't work. You have the Justice Select Committee saying, abolish all sentences of under one year. The crisis, the, the kind of the, the focus on expanding for many, many years, the, the escalation of a prison population from around 40,000 people in prison in the early 1990s to over 80,000 people in prison for the last few years. A, a doubling of the prison population was quite remarkable. There's a recognition now we can't continue down this path anymore. So are there any glimmers of light we can see in the current system? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the glimmers of light um, are, are actually coming from the voices of people like Gorg, and Stuart in terms of they want to recognise that, that prisons don't work. So I think the glimmer, of, the glimmer of light is that there seems to be at least some partial recognition that prisons uh, are failed institutions. Now, there are such initiatives um, around therapeutic prisons. So you have, for example, HMP Grendon, which is not so far from, from Milton Keynes and the Open University, um, which has had a very strong therapeutic approach so but that can only hold a few hundred people at any one time and it's it's been uh, something which you would say well this is kind of quite positive it's not based on punishment it's based on trying to have a therapeutic intervention with somebody and there's there's some evidence that 
um, it can be helpful. It hasn't proved to be enormously successful because prisons are not very good settings for therapy and rehabilitation and medical attention and care. They generally kind of are not good, but that, that has been tried. Um, you, there's been other uh, initiatives going back, for example, to Scotland in the 1970s. The Barlini Special Unit was particularly um, uh, successful in terms of dealing with a small number of, of, of recalcitrant prisoners and actually helping them to, to move forward. And this again was based on therapy and engagement. It was again on investing in people. The idea of a good prison has been proposed by many. The problem with the initiatives around prisons, which where you see the glimmers of light, they are almost, I would say, flickers of light because they keep on getting snubbed out. So there are people who would say, well, we can have humane prisons, we can have healthy prisons, we can have moral prisons, um, we can have institutions which actually are able to kind of like to do the kind of things that some of the early reformers hoped for. But what you find is the glimmers of light are, are dealing with very, very small numbers of people and generally fade after a couple of years. And almost like the, the overwhelming darkness of the prison seems to somehow snub out any kind of moments of, of hope. And, and it's almost like the, the, even the attempts to reform the prison, like Patterson's ideas of the, of the Etonian-like schools in the village of Borstal for young people, they soon got subsumed. They soon got kind of um, sucked into what a prison is because if a prison, or at least the institutions of prisons as we have now, if they are grounded in punishment, they are grounded in hurt, an injury and they are not about kind of bringing out the best of people the way we find in terms of our justice system for for, for hope is in things like therapeutic communities um, which have been um, even for dealing with people who've uh, who've kind of been engaged with with sexual offenses that they actually they can um, offer something in terms of helping people move forward if they really want to move forward um, there are also institutions um, where we can think of um, in terms of compensation restorative justice, which have allowed us non-penal ways of moving forward. You, you, can, you can think about um, elements which have tried to engage with supporting the victim. If we want to really deal with the hurt and the harm of something that's gone wrong, you start by trying to redress and put right you don't start by punishing and creating more hurt and depriving somebody. You start by looking at the person who's been harmed and saying to him, what can we do to make it better? Now, of course, that might not be possible because somebody might have died um, or somebody might have been injured in a way which is life-changing or they might have faced a trauma which is going to take them many, many years to recover from. Um, but you start by trying to put it right and you start by trying to actually engage with the person who's who's been who's been the victim in the first instance and that's of course isn't what our justice our criminal justice our criminal process actually does it looks for vengeance it looks to punish it looks on the grounds of public protection but it does not achieve any of those things share your thoughts on this episode's topic by using the hashtag OU informed this episode was brought to you by the OU social media engagement team and produced and presented by Greg Harwood we'll see you next time